everyone. Welcome to lesson number seven out of 21 that we need to complete for the rest of the year. Well, what we're going to talk about today is pressure. So we're actually going to condense in a couple days worth of stuff into one 30 minute lesson here. So we'll move a little bit fast, but uh, we'll get all the main things that we need to, right? So what are the main things? And what the biggest thing is, well, here's the question of the day that we would be popping up normally for you. What determines pressure, right? So what determines pressure is basically the force that's being exerted over a particular area. So there are two big things, two, well, yeah, two big things going on here, right? How much force is being pushed on things and on what size area is that force being pushed on? And that's what we wanna to get to today. So you, again, you don't have to write these down, but the first vocabulary word for the day would be this guy right here, right? Pressure, right? It's the force divided by the area. So um, this again goes into Newton's laws right um for um for this and everything um there's lots of examples that you can get into for this right the one that i'm going to use is a knife right when you're cutting something um that's hard to cut you want to use a sharp knife so i've got two knives here i've got my butter knife that i grabbed right here and a sharper knife right so you've got two knives that you can cut with and everything and let's say hold on here if i go down i've got a lovely potato that i got here. now if i try to cut the potato with the butter knife now it's certainly that I, not that I can't cut the potato with the butter knife. If I cut and I cut and I cut and I'm pushing fairly hard here, hold on, fairly hard, but uh, I mean, eventually I do cut through it, but it's really hard because the blade of the knife, it's very, very dull, right? You know, it's a very, you know, kind of fat blade and everything. So I can rub my hand on this all I want. And yeah, there, there's no blood pouring out all over or anything like that, right? So um, that's no problem at all. Now, if I use a much sharper knife, right, if I, if I use a sharper knife and I do the same exact thing, well, this time, I mean, you can see it cuts right through, I mean, without any problem at all. And the reason for that is all the pressure that I'm pushing down on the knife, right, so on here, all the pressure that I'm using pushing down on the knife, it's all being um, basically pushed into one very, very tiny, thin little spot on the edge of the blade. This blade is much, it's not super, super sharp, but it's definitely a lot sharper than, you know, the butter knife over here. While the butter knife, I'm fine going this with my finger on and everything. I would definitely not want to do that on, I mean, you know, I, I could touch it and everything's going to be fine, but I certainly wouldn't want to rub my finger on this with any kind of vigor and everything like that um, because of that. So pressure, you know, there are two big things, right? How much force is being pushed on, you know, the object determines pressure, obviously but over what area is it, right? And with a sharp knife, it focuses all that pressure in one tiny, tiny little spot. If it's a dull knife, right? I mean, it's still focused in one area, but the area is much bigger. The place that's actually cutting the food is much wider. So that's why you don't get as um, you know, good of a reaction cutting with a really dull knife. So if you've got something hard to cut, you know, even harder than a potato here, make sure that your knife is really sharp and it makes your work much easier for you. All right, um, how do you measure this, right? Well, the official way um, of measuring pressure is with something called the Pascal, right? This is how many um, units of pressure there are, right? So you wouldn't want to say there's 10 pressures compared to 20 pressures, right? Um, instead, you would say there's 20 Pascals of pressure or there's 30 Pascals of pressure, right? Now, here in America, remember, we are different. We're special here in America, right? So you can see on the little picture right here, right? Um, these are what pretty much everyone in the entire planet uses is going to be Pascals, right? You know, I've got, you know, 20,000 Pascals or I've got 28,000 Pascals. I would be really bad on this, you know, scenario here. Here in America, though, we often use PSI, right? Or pounds per square inch, right? So you can see it would be 500 or 1,000 or 1,500, you know, PSIs or pounds per square inch. It's still the same idea, though. It's just the scale that we um, use compared to what everyone else uses in measuring all this pressure that we have for it. Okay, there's not a joke of the day, but there is a cartoon for today, right? So you've got the two mosquitoes and they're watching and one of their friends explodes and they're saying, I guess that's why it's not gonna have high blood pressure. I thought it was funny. <laughs> so anyway, um, so yeah, there's the pressure joke of the day for us, right? Um, normally you'd fill in all kinds of notes and things like that, but for us, we'll just kind of read through these, right? So you've got, Pressure is the amount of force per unit of area, right? So it's how much force is being pushed on something, but over what size area, right? Is it all focused to one little tiny area or is it spread out a lot, right? Now this pressure that exists in fluids 
it's caused by the motion, by the weight of the particles that are moving around in it. So I happen to have with me some fluid right here, right? And you have to imagine like, you know, if you could see each individual water molecule, they're all moving around in there and that motion of them, that's what's causing this pressure to actually happen, right? So um, the further down you go inside a fluid, the more pressure there is. This is true for liquids, kind of like this, or down here in my little, you know, picture down here. It's also true, remember, gases are a type of fluid in physics, right? So it's true for this too. So what that means is, if in our picture right here, think about it like this, up really, really high where the clouds are, there's very little pressure because there's almost no air above that, right? The, you know, up here, you get into outer space, right? If you go down here, let's say at the top of the mountains, there's more air pressure, but far less than where you and I normally live and everything, because it's only all of these air molecules on top of it. But if you go down here, you know, to about where Pennsylvania is and everything on our little mini map right here, right? Now there's a fair amount of air pressure because you've got all of this air, all the air on top of it pushing down on it and everything. And same thing, if you go to the beach, right? Down here at the beach, there's even more pressure because you've got all this air on top of all that air and everything. And if you go underwater, it doesn't end, right? Now you've got, you know, if you go down here underwater, you've still got all of this air pushing down on you, plus the water that's on top of you. And obviously, if you go down to the bottom of the ocean, that's where the most pressure is because you've got all the water plus all the air pushing on you. And it, it does add up to a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of pressure going on for it. Now, these particles, they're moving constantly in all directions. So one little water molecule is going this way, another one's going that way, some of them are going this way and that way and every. There are just trillions and trillions of them just bopping around, you know, moving, bumping into each other all the time. They're going in all different directions. Sometimes they collide with, you know, the actual container. Sometimes they collide with each other. Sometimes they collide with the tree. Well, if the tree's in the way and everything, right? Um, so there's constant motion like that going on for it. Um, that work that's being done, those particles moving around, right? That's what we call pressure, right? That's the fluid pressure that's moving around with those, right? Fluids exert pressure equally in all directions. So it doesn't matter which way you go, right? Some are pushing down, some are going this way, that way, up, diagonally. They're all going around in all different directions. It's totally random. No one's trying to organize which way those little particles are moving, right? So the way that you're gonna calculate pressure Right, you need to know the force, how much force, right? How much force something's being pushed on it, but you also need to know what's the area, how big is the surface that's being pushed on, right? So both of those are um, you know, really, really important factors to think about, right? Um, so I always ask this question, right? Which has more pressure? Which would you rather be stepped on? A lady walking around or an elephant, right? Which one would be, you know, if you got to choose, which one? You know, like you had to lay your hand down and they said, you know, one of them just step on you, which would you pick? Most people would pick the lady over the elephant, but that might not be a very good choice, right? Because an elephant, if you ever saw their feet, right? They're huge. I mean, we're talking, they're really, really big. Their feet so big that they spread their force out, right? They spread that force of standing out. So actually, if you'd slip your hand under an elephant's foot, I wouldn't want to do it maybe on like pavement, but if it was a somewhat softer surface and everything like that, the elephant could step on your hand and it wouldn't crush it like, ah, it wouldn't mangle your foot hand or anything like that. What if it was a lady but wearing high heels, right? Well, now most of the force comes down the back of her leg, down her heel, and in all that pressure, well, most of that pressure, it's all focused on this little tiny high heel right here. So again, if you had your hand out and, and um, you know, she put all of her weight, well, it's not too dissimilar to imagine like a pen, right? You know, the size of this is pretty similar to the size of this guy down here. So imagine someone saying they're going to put half their body weight, right, onto, they're going to do like a handstand, putting half their weight onto, you know, a pen right here, and then that's going to be on your hand. That's going to do some serious damage, right? That's going to hurt a lot. So you definitely wouldn't want to do that. So the amount of surface area matters a tremendous amount when we're talking about, um, the pressure. Oh, here, this one right here, right? Remember, well, or I should tell you, you know, fluids move from where there's high pressure. If they're all cooped up, there's high pressure to a place where there's low pressure. This is why if I've got a jar and you smack a hole in the bottom of it, this is what makes all the water want to run out, right? It's all kind of to contain and there's high pressure here. And it's thinking, hey, if we run out, ooh, there's less pressure there. So it wants to flow out because of that. All right, um, let's see here. Oh, and then what we're gonna do is let me cut to my kitchen really quick and I'll show you the whiz. Oh yes, the whiz. All right, everyone. 
This is a demo about pressure that I like to call affectionately the whizzer. I've got a container right here. It has several holes drilled into it and I have a warm pot of whiz. So all you have to do, it's fairly simple to get this to work, is add the whiz into the container and pretty quickly you can see what's going on here. You can see the effect of pressure, right? At the top there's a hole but there's not a whole lot of pressure because there's only the water molecules between the top of the surface and the hole, you know, to force the water out. As you go down, there's more pressure, hence it's sticking out even more, and more pressure, and more pressure, and more pressure, and that just continues. And if I add a little more whiz here, you can see the lower down, the lower down the hole is, the more it shoots out because the more pressure there is. There's all this water, plus all this water, plus all this water, plus all that water, and all this water is pushing down. So this one, for example, it wants to shoot out further than the holes that are above it. Right, so the further down the hole is, the more pressure there is, and the sh further out the whiz shoots. So hopefully you enjoyed uh, seeing the whiz here, right? Here's kind of a zoomed in version if you had trouble seeing this, but um, you've got the whiz in the container right here, right? There's low pressure because there are only these water molecules right here pushing down. So there's not very much whiz pressure right here. This one, oh, you can, <coughs> you can see there's tremendously more pressure because you've got all this water plus all that water and then so on. The further down you go, the straighter out the whiz shoots because you've got more and more and more and more pressure pushing down on it, right? So that's what's going on with that whiz um, for us. And then let's see here. Okay, so then we can kind of jump into this. This is another, this is the second day, but we're going to do it all in one because we're kind of skipping some of the other little, um, some of the other stuff for us and everything, right? So this pressure, how does it change based on how high you are? Right? Well, the higher up you are, well, the less pressure there actually is. And I don't know if you guys remember this from a couple of years ago, but uh, this was the highest um, free fall jump anyone's ever done, right? So if you kind of watch here, they actually use the balloon to get the guy up super high. Uh, let's see if we can kind of like move along a little bit faster here to save you a little bit of time. He goes up higher, he goes up higher. The higher he goes, the less pressure there is because there's less and less stuff on top of him. There's less air on top of the person. Eventually, they go so high, they open up the door, and it literally is like he's on the very edge of outer space. You can see the curvature of Earth, right? The sky is black even though it's daylight where he's at. There's almost no pressure, so that's why he's wearing the pressure spacesuit, right? To keep some pressure on his body. He jumps, and he, he falls down, 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 down. But the further down he goes, there's more air on top of him, more air on top of him, more air on top of him. So the pressure increases, increases, increases. Eventually there's enough air he can open up the parachute, and yay! Everything's safe and sound again. Right? So um, the lower you are, the more pressure there is, right? Remember I was telling you, there's more pressure on you when you're at the beach than if you're on vacation in the mountains. Um, just because of that, the more the particles are pushed on top of you, right? Um, there's an activity that you don't have to worry about doing this year. Um, and then for this one, right, how is it that fluids create pressure? It's basically, it's the force of all those individual particles on top of you. Let's uh, use the ping pong example, right? Let's say someone says, Hey, I'm going to put one ping pong ball on top of your head. You'd think, no big deal, right? But what if they said, I'm going to put a million ping pong balls on top of you, right? It would kill you. You'd die by ping pong balls. That would be a terrible way to go, although it'd be humorous on your gravestone, right? Um, so all those ping pong balls, they do add up. Even though one ping pong ball is so light, you almost couldn't feel it at all. If you had a million of them on top of you, like all somehow like, you know, focused so they're all their weight is crushing down on you, it's probably going to kill you, right? I mean, they're they're really really heavy when you talk about you know a million ping pong balls and everything, right? So that's you know a good way you can do it. How about this? Um, the can crush example right here of pressure, right? Here we go. Here is a shipping container, and all they did is they just pull all the air out of it, right? So the only thing that's smushing this can right here, this really big train can basically, is just air pressure. When they pull all the air out of it. Right? Um, the air pressure smashes it, right? So um, you've got this tremendous amount of pressure that's inside of it. 
Now, normally, on here, normally if you have, you know, just a trained car, it doesn't get crushed by pressure because, well, it's not airtight, right? You know, some air comes in. So even though there's a humongous amount of air pressure pushing down on it, I mean, think all the air molecules from outer space to this container ship right here, right? They're all pushing down on it. Normally, though, some of them are on the inside. So some of them are pushing towards the outside. From inside, they're pushing out, and it balances out. There's no big deal. What they did for this is they sucked all the air out of it, right? So they sucked all the air out of it, and that's where, you know, it ends up looking all, hold on here. Can I get it to the picture? That's where it looks like this right here, right? Once all the air is pulled out of it, now um, the air on the inside's not pushing out, so it's just the air on the outside pushing in, and it literally crushes the container. Right, so um, kind of a good example of how strong air pressure actually is for us. Hey everyone, one last um, pressure example that I really, really wanted to give you. This is one of my personal favorites. Is this guy right here, the fire piston? Right now, if um, you're out, if you've ever gone camping, I guess I should say, right? It's no problem. If you want to start a fire, you just whip out your lighter or some matches or something like that, and there's no problem at all. But what do you do if you're out camping somewhere where you can't be replenished with new supplies? And it's just, I mean, you can't bring like 20 lighters with you. I mean, you have to pack all kinds of other stuff. Well, there's a thing called a fire piston, and this is not new. This has been around for thousands of years. This just happens to be a new one I got off Amazon. Right, and what a fire piston does is it uses pressure to start fires, right? So what you do is, well, there are two pieces to it. All right, there is uh, the canister. There's basically a cylinder right here, and there's the piston part of it and everything, right? And what happens, or I guess I should say, the key to it is there's this tiny little rubber stopper that goes around right here that makes an airtight seal. So when you put the two of them together, like so, right? All the air is trapped inside of there, right? It's an airtight seal. The air molecules that are in there, they can't get out. So just like I've been telling you, they're moving around, you know, right about now, the speed is probably kind of like this. They're kind of like moving around. Some are bouncing back and forth. Some are bouncing up and down, everything like that. Now with a fire piston, if I, if I push down on it, so the space is much, much smaller now, well, now inside of here, the air molecules, they have to move much faster. They're not, um, well, I guess I should say, they're not physically moving faster, but they're bumping into each other much faster because the amount of space they have is much smaller. And if I push down really hard on it, the amount of space is really small, and now those air molecules are bumping into each other, I mean, tremendously fast. Now, the way that the, um, a fire piston works to start a fire is, in the directions, you take something flammable. So supposedly you're outside, so maybe some ground up leaves or some dried moss works really well, or maybe some dry grass. And you just need a tiny, tiny bit. And you put it down in the bottom of the fire piston right there. And what you do is you actually take it, hold it like this, and you actually smack it really hard against um, a piece of wood is what they recommend. Um, so you don't break it or anything like that, but smack it really hard. And what that does is for just a brief, like maybe a half a second, right? Basically, the plunger's pushed up so tight, so tight against the bottom of it, that I mean, there's just like a tremendously small amount of space, but those air molecules, they don't slow down. They're still moving the same speed. So they're bumping into each other so, I mean, fast, that um, there's so much speed, there's just a tremendous amount of friction between the air molecules. And it's so fast that it literally heats up the, um, it heats up all the stuff that's in it. It heats up the air and it literally catches whatever's in there on fire, right? And so then the directions go, once you've got basically some smoldering embers right in there, you kind of pop it open, right? And you dump this out onto like something that you can catch on fire, like so maybe some dry grass or dry moss or something like that. And then it's a matter of, it's kind of like all those survival videos where the guy's blowing on it, you know, very gently and everything like that. And then they put in some sticks and then, you know, before you know it, you have a raging bonfire. Right, so that's my personal favorite example about pressure. So hopefully um, you got all this in. What you wanna do is there'll be a couple short videos for you to watch in, the, um, in today's lesson. There's a reading for you to do, and then there'll be the quiz. Then you're done with lesson number seven.